thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Design Doc Podcast. Uh, I have with me today Amos King of Binary Noggin. Um, you might know Amos from Binary Noggin or from the Elixir Outlaws podcast or several other adventures that he's done over the years. And hopefully we'll get into that a little bit. So Amos, thanks for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. Uh, we were just talking, like I said, it's really nice to see people. Yeah, it's um, for anyone in the future... Ooh. Uh, this is during the uh, COVID-19 quarantine time period. So we've, uh, I, I've been locked inside my house for the most part for um, over a month. I would assume it's probably been the same for you. Yeah, I think, I think this is like week seven or maybe eight. Um, I just rented an office right before this <laughs> and moved all of my stuff. And then, then everything went down. Uh, so I've, I've run over to my office a few times late at night to pick up a few things uh, that I forgot, like this microphone. Um, but other than that, yeah, I've, I've been fairly stuck at home. We did go hiking the other day, which was really nice. Yeah, and having the chance to get outside is, is pretty sweet. We just had a park put into our neighborhood, like it was supposed to open in spring. Um, and it's like soft opened, I guess is what you'd call it. They've kind of stopped construction for the time being, but a good chunk of it is finished. So, uh, but they haven't announced it or anything. So it's actually a fairly empty park that we've been taking our dogs on a walk in and it's been nice. Oh, that's, that is really nice. So you, you have multiple dogs. I, I do. Yeah. I've got um, an Australian shepherd named Luna and then a uh, rat terrier named shrimp. Nice. Nice. <laughs> He's a small like dude. I like that. And so one, Australian Shepherd's pretty good size, like 30, yeah, she, 30, 40 pounds. So she's about 50 pounds, yeah. 50 pounds, okay, yeah. And then Shrimp is about 20 pounds. That's I, that's about, about our dogs. We have two dogs also. We have a, a Pooley, the dreadlock dogs. Um, we have one of those. Uh, when she has all of her hair, she's about 40 pounds, but when you shave her, she's about 30. Uh, and then um, we have a, I'm going to get this wrong, Patone de Tallure which is my son's dog. And it's like a little fluffy, you know, like eight to 14 pound dog when it's fully grown. And it's still, it, we got it for him um, for Christmas. And uh, so she's like six months old. Oh, wow. That's, I, I totally get the hair thing, but it's so hard to like actually imagine putting numbers to it. Like 10 pounds of hair seems like so much, but <laughs> I, I get it. My Australian shepherd, um, who is sneaking into the the office right now? Actually, Do you want to say hi? Hop up. Oh man! Yeah, she sheds uh, twice a year for six months at a time. Is the the ongoing Australian <laughs> Shepherd joke? Nice. Anyways, um, I could talk about the dogs for the entirety of this, but we probably should talk about some of the interesting stuff that you've done. So. What really got you on my radar originally is that you've kind of gone down a path that I've been interested in following. Um, you've ditched, for lack of a better word, the standard way of working, and you started your own shop, like your own software shop. Um, like, what what motivated you to do that? Uh, you know, I grew up. My my father was an entrepreneur, um, mostly in real estate, and I grew up watching him work in in kind of the freedom that he had and uh my my mother also did a lot of um, entrepreneurial stuff hertz was a um frequently short-lived uh and not not because she was doing bad ed or anything but she just wanted to try something new all the time that was her and and i think i i got bit by that a little bit i always said that i wanted to have my own business uh i was driving 100 miles each way to work from 2006 to 2013 and uh i you know i loved where i worked that's why i could do that and then i just started to get burnt out on the driving and uh, my last project at that company was i was driving 100 miles to the east to then uh to st louis to then get on a computer and pair with uh programmers for my client that was in san francisco and uh, I was like, can I work from home a couple days a week? And they said, we don't really do that here. And so the next day I turned in my two weeks and uh, moved on to another company that said I could work from home. But um, at, at the, toward the end of that, that was about six months long that I worked there. Um, I was looking for something new 
and uh, had been really thinking about starting my own business. And um, I had an old uh, client, I want to call him a client, they, the, the client's product owner had moved on from the company where he was my customer. And he found out I moved on and he called me up and said, hey, you want to come work for me and build a team? And I said, I've, you know, I've been thinking about starting my own business. And he said, oh, well, we can do that as contracting. You can bring a team of five. Let's do like a one year, two year contract. And I was like, okay, we can, we can make that happen. So I, I dove in face first uh, with a little bit of luck and, um, you know, just working, working hard in the past and, and making connections that I didn't even realize were going to turn into a business later. Um, and then I probably wouldn't have pulled the trigger. I'd always thought about it for years, except for the fact that really the only cost to start a programming company is like a laptop. So I had the money and I started it with cash. Uh, and then I've run it since then with, um, with no credit. The company owns no credit cards. We just have a checking account and we do everything with cash. Nice. That's awesome. I, um, uh, on that on a similar vein, I always joke that I, I really like to build things, and the easiest toolbox to carry around is a laptop. So I, I totally get it because I would I would build with a hammer and and nails all day, or with um, a soldering iron, um, really just anything. But there's something very convenient about slipping a MacBook in a backpack and, and going to work. Right, and anywhere like you people, you can I, I solder and stuff too. I love to do hardware. Um, I did communications equipment in the Air Force for 13 years. <coughs> Excuse me. And was doing uh, soldering and fixing of equipment. I was not an operator on the radio equipment. I was a maintainer. And uh, when you pull out a soldering iron in a restaurant with a little smoke going all over, people look at you funny. So you can't really do that at Starbucks and get away with it very long. I tried. Or you... I did try. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get about 30 minutes and then they're like, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny you need to put that away it's a weapon i mean <laughs> if it heats up enough that's, that's dangerous that's true and the soldering iron that i have uh has a digital readout and you can set it and i don't know how high it goes i've had it at 800 degrees holy so, cow uh i imagine it would it would yeah it'd be really bad. no joke it's a good way to warm up your coffee if you're not opposed to ruining your soldering iron <laughs> nice yeah. Um, so with Binary Noggin, what's what's your team look like? I think last time we talked, you said you had just hired someone else. That was a couple months ago, though. Yeah. So uh, Connor Rigby joined the team. Uh, over the years, I've had a lot of subcontractors and um, no no real employees. I have, I've had interns and stuff like that. And this, I moved to Kansas City almost two years ago, and part of moving was wanting to grow the company. The funny thing is, is I moved to the city thinking I would be around more people more often. Uh, and, and then I end up hiring somebody who's not even here. He's in California. Uh, Connor is amazing. He's another guy that, that knows his way around a soldering iron. Um, and, and so Connor joined us and it's, it's been pretty fantastic from there. I also just recently hired, uh, an assistant and then I have two interns, uh, that they've been with me about a year and a half, two years. Like they both haven't been here the same amount of time, but it's been it's been nice having them. Uh, and I, I like being able to uh, sit down with my interns and, and work through the the things that they're working through. One of them is uh, design, and she does some um, office helping out stuff. Was kind of an assistant before I hired one. And then the other intern is actually a computer science student. And uh, recently I just one day was like, you know what? Maybe you should take uh, Dave Thomas's Elixir class online. And so for a few weeks, I just, that's what I paid him to do. He's like, just go take this class. And then come report on it. Uh, so I like, I feel like I'm giving, giving back to the community. And I love to see people excited about learning. Yeah, it's always a good feeling too to have someone invest in you with time and, and money and, and say, Hey, go learn something. I'll pay you to do that. That's unfortunately less common than, than I think it should be. So we actually at binary noggin, that is one of the things that from day one, when I started the company was really important to me and I blocked off 
Thursdays. Uh, I've been blocking off Thursdays since 2013. Uh, and everyone in the company on Thursdays gets to pick what they do, work on whatever they want. I always say, unless it's morally or legally objectionable. Uh, and somebody said, whose morals? And I said, well, I guess it's my company, so they're my morals. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, so, so like, that's a big thing to me. We call it noggin day. And people might see it on Twitter. We, we tweet about it and what we're working on. And try to do open source stuff, internal projects, things like that. But it's always just like, basically learn, go out and learn, have fun. Um, and, and so I, I did that at the beginning and I, I've done it ever since. And we haven't stopped. It's always been Thursdays. Cool. Um, so you mentioned open source. You also mentioned Elixir. Is uh, most of the work that you're doing in Elixir and... Have you open sourced any Elixir projects? Yeah, for about three years, I think three years. It's been full time Elixir um, up until November of last year. And now I have a project that I'm working on that is Ruby and Elixir. But yeah, the Elixir took off like crazy once I, I decided to pull the trigger and, and try, to, try to go to Elixir full time. Uh, and I was rather surprised at how quickly that that skyrocketed. And that job market, I think, has a lot more job openings than, than people realized. Yeah, I am uh, full time <clears throat> at Team Snap at the moment, mm -hmm. um, and we are a Ruby and Elixir shop as well. Um, so we have a, quite a few microservices in Elixir and, and a couple uh, not so micro services in Ruby. Um, and it, it seems like a pretty great kit. Most of the Ruby devs are really excited to, to learn Elixir and to play around with it. Um, and it, it seems like a fairly straightforward transition. I hadn't done much Elixir or Ruby before Team Snap, so I don't, I don't really know what that transition looks like, but it seems like most people are doing great with it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's in a pretty easy movie. Move, movie, move. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty easy move to go from one to the other, I think. Uh, in some ways, that is fantastic, and it opens a lot of doors for people. And in other ways, it's frustrating to watch some people come in, and, and I guarantee I was guilty of it. Uh, it's hard to look back that three years ago and see where I was. I should pull up some of my code and find out. But like writing things that look like objects and work like objects and trying to jam object-oriented programming into that functional world uh, is something that I see constantly now. And I'm again, I'm sure that I was doing it, but now that I've gotten used to the uh, other side, it's like, oh, what are you doing here? Why why are you doing it this way? And and then it comes down to it, and it's like, oh, yeah, you're, you're recreating an object or uh, Rails, exactly. Um, but it the syntax being similar and stuff opens up a whole set of doors for people to come in from that side and yeah, i mean elixir was born out of the pain of some of the things that were in rails and, and ruby so uh, it, it's a, a fantastic transition like that's where it started and that's where it still seems to be going I, I love the ruby community and the stuff that's come out of that so it excites me whenever i see more people that i know from the ruby community starting to do elixir and then i yeah. feel i feel sorry for them because they're going to try to not put do at the end of every function whenever, whenever they're writing the elixir like it looks like ruby until it doesn't and then it's frustrating when you're first learning yeah i could i could definitely see some of the frustrations there i generally tend to like it in in piping and and the functional syntax is just really really nice but um some things that would be wonderful backports to ruby possibly yeah maybe uh, one of the things that I miss whenever I'm going and working in Ruby is uh, like the ability to, I want to say like spread spread the load of something and then come back together, um, like a true uh, distributed map reduce. So I, I've seen many times in Rails projects where uh, we have some kind of process that is going to be expensive and can be split out of a, to a bunch of things. So we kick it off to sidekick and a lot of background workers, but then we would really like it to come back together after all of those workers are done. 
and and be able to um, like I don't know get I don't, for, I'm trying to think of a great example, but just gather that stuff back together at the end, like after you've changed what it looks like. Um, I guess re reduce it <laughs> in the map reduce sense, and uh, and it's it's just really hard in in that Ruby world to do that and take advantage of all the cores that you have. Uh, Sidekick Enterprise helps a little bit, um, and and th there's been a lot of fantastic work going there. But the batching stuff that I've seen that does allow you to have like a callback at the end of everything being done does a lot of stuff in memory. And then if you have really big jobs that you fan out like that, now you have a ton of stuff sitting in memory all at once, and, and uh, you can maybe run out of memory. So I just want to go back over to Elixir <laughs> and do it there. And that's where a lot of the Ruby to Elixir goes that I've seen, or like dashboard views, because you can have data that just stays in memory. <clears throat> and and dealing with WebSockets is a lot easier, I believe, with Elixir and Phoenix channels than it is with like Action Cable. Yeah, I actually haven't used Action Cable, um, but I, I can vouch for my little Elixir knowledge that I have um, and, and Sockets and Phoenix being fairly straightforward to work with. You, you ask about open source projects too. Um, that's actually part of how I got started in the Elixir world. Uh, I first was just making little commits to Elixir and Phoenix, mostly documentation updates. Um, I did a, a refactor of some code in there and added a, a feature and shrunk the code. I don't remember what it was exactly. I wrote a blog post about it. And then uh, I went and I guess I actually got into to the community through uh, giving a talk at Elixir Days in Florida. I had a, I had a question about like, what if you didn't have a database? What if you just stored everything in gen servers and processes? And I knew like long-term that's not sustainable, but I wanted to just experiment with that. So I wrote up a proposal to give a talk never expecting it to be picked because I didn't know what I was talking about. And then they picked it. Uh, and when I got down there, I gave a talk. Um, I had done Erlang in the past. So I, I had some ideas around it and I had played with Elixir for years at that point. And um, I think three years. And in, in giving the talk, I, I met Frank Hunleth, who is the, um, I guess, benevolent leader with Jason Schneck of the Nerves Project, and ended up starting up an open source project called Grove Pi with uh, Frank. And Grove Pi is um, like a hat for a Raspberry Pi that has some easy to connect sensors. And then I just started implementing sensors for it. Um, we would love more people to implement sensors for it. I, I don't get to work on it very often and I can't buy every sensor that the I think it's seed studios that might put those out that are out there um, so that that turned into a to just going to a conference turned into doing an open source project and then that turned into doing hardware development in Elixir yeah nerves is is that the project that lets you run Elixir like on metal um, for like embedded systems or anything yeah, well, it, it it has to be a, a system that can run Linux. So, it, it but it is it manages the whole Linux stack for you, and kind of has the philosophy of uh, you don't put anything onto the server that's not absolutely needed. Um, or I call it a server because I did server work for some years, but onto the to the microcontroller into the Linux install that isn't needed to run. So you you have to you build that up over time for what your exact project needs, uh, which also makes it more secure because you're not putting a bunch of extra stuff into your image that you don't that you you don't know the attack surface of, and maybe you're not using it. So why put it there? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that nerves has been, you know, it's it's used in giant work at Schneider Electric doing uninterrupted power supplies for um, big data centers. Uh, it's it's in home automation equipment. Nerves is, is out there a lot more than what I think a lot of people know. 
Yeah, that's that's neat to think about. I mean, often you hear when when you're thinking about like specifically home automation, but I guess really any like embedded systems, C, C plus plus, Go, maybe maybe Python when you think of Raspberry Pis. But it's it's cool to have representation from other languages. Yeah, and I I really think that Elixir is made for it. The multiple processes and everything if you have each little sensor on its own process and you have a hiccup with that sensor it doesn't crash the whole system which i've had to deal with in hardware development and see in the past where one little hiccup just crashed the whole project and makes a really sad day <laughs> do you get um with with that project do you get most of the like recoverable features that you get from is that from elixir or is that from the beam it's it's the, a lot of the recoverable stuff is really from the beam itself uh, and the OTP uh, library, which you know, Elixir is making heavy use of, but all of that, a lot of that is written in Erlang or um, probably down in, even into C and, and Beam itself. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to look into that project more. I, I didn't know it was so widespread. It, it's It's been a whole lot of fun for me and turned into doing artificial intelligence on cameras and that's um, another open source project uh, that I worked on with Connor after he came on board. We're, we're working on a camera system, and uh, we did a project called Turbo JPEG that allows you to uh, stream off of a camera. Um, and it's, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to mess up the encoding. I don't remember the encoding right now. <laughs> but Turbo JPEG takes in that encoding and turns it into a JPEG stream. Um, and allows you to do uh, a few other things and we, we tested it and put it out there and then the um, there's a group that just recently released a pretty good sized blog post about using um, turbo jpeg and some of the other tools out there to build like a twitch type streaming service um, targeted at an audience that uh, of like weightlifters and so they can get like feedback while they're weightlifting and, and stuff like that. And That's so I thought it, it was really awesome to find out that it's being used in something outside of what we're using now. Yeah, that's really like the dream of any open source project, right? Like, yeah. I, I build something, I put it out there, and someone else loves it. And if they love it enough, they help maintain it. Well, and that's, that's, the, that's the real hope. <laughs> do, do some work with me. Uh, yeah. I, like, I like working with people, so it's just an excuse to work with somebody new. Yeah, it seems like it might be a good avenue to um, like bring in hires as well, especially if people are like familiar with the tech that you're using and they show that they're skilled and, and care and, and they're easy to work with. It's mm -hmm. like that's the dream take home programming assignment, right? Right, <laughs> like, go, go work on the open source project. Yeah. Um, circling back to binary noggin, what, so what type of work do you all do? Is it mostly like on-site consulting training or, um, Hey, we'll build that for you type of work. Um, most of it has been in team augmentation. I wouldn't say on-site consulting, like we go on-site once in a while, but most of our work is, is remote and working with existing teams on existing products. Uh, we do build products for people and have talked about um, doing training um, and, and in the past we've also done uh, where I, I don't it's not training and it's not working with the team necessarily it's more like we'll do some code reviews uh, and look at your code and give you feedback and maybe pair with you like an hour a week for people who uh, maybe they're maybe their company's just getting into elixir uh, or into hardware development and they just they just really want feedback but they don't need somebody full time they just need somebody to give them feedback and we, we do that too i would love to get into more we build your projects for you um, and before all this covid stuff i was talking to different companies about that and looking to hire more people and i kind of put all of it on hold um, the i still have people calling for work it's just they're they're no longer wanting to talk about building a brand new product because they're like i don't know when we're going to be able to release it or i, I can't you know, i don't know if i'm going to be able to get it built um, because factories may not have people working on it and different things like that so that kind of all got 
put on the back burner for a little bit. Yeah, that's a shame, but it makes sense. So with the, the pull request thing that you mentioned, I'm kind of curious, is it like pay per pull request or do they pay like a monthly rate? And that's just like, is there a cap of pull request? How do you, how do you handle that? Um, so how I've, I've done it in the past uh, was like a retainer fee. And then I just track the time that I spent doing it. Uh, it as I've been going and I'm talking to somebody right now, I was thinking of moving more towards like, how about I just say that I'll work with you five hours a week and you'll pay, you just pay this flat fee and I'll do five hours a week. I'm, I'm a big fan of providing value and focusing more on value. And I don't really care a whole lot if I work a little bit more, like if I say, hey, I'll, I'll give you five hours a week, but we work for six hours. I'm probably not gonna care. If we work 20 hours, we should probably start talking about a, a different form of contract. But even my regular contracts, I don't charge hourly, I charge weekly. Uh, we work four days a week and you know, typically eight-ish hours a day. But if we need to work 10 or 12 once in a while, or you need to call me at midnight, I don't think that anybody should be going, and we should really call Connor in here, but it's gonna cost us this much per hour and it's it's two o'clock in the morning. Maybe we'll just fix it in the next 15 minutes. And then we didn't wake him up and have to pay him a bunch of money. And then come six or 7 a.m., they're calling us anyway. Because now they've spent more time and money when maybe we could have fixed it in 10 minutes. Maybe we can't. I'm not saying that we're doing any better than the other people on the team. But you shouldn't be looking at who's the best person on the team for this job. And then saying, oh, let's not call him because it's going to cost us a bunch. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but at the same time, if I'm called every night at two o'clock in the morning, we're this, this we're gonna have to talk. <laughs> yeah, I I totally understand. I mean, I, I think that's the way it should be for just about anything. Like on call schedules, like if you if being on call means you're getting paged every time you're on call at two in the morning, that's probably not a good good way to handle things. Same with just contracting. Like it, it it's okay to in my eyes go a little above and beyond or even out of the barriers every now and then, but um, any, if, if it becomes a pattern, it's a problem. Right. Right. And now, and my other thing is maybe I caused that problem. <laughs> you should have me there at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. That is also a pretty good point. <laughs> um, so I wanted to shift a bit to talk about podcasts and, uh, yet again, an area that I'm pretty interested in, but I was curious. So you run this agile life and elixir outlaws. How did you build your initial listener base for those podcasts? Uh, I, w- I want to say that they're they're pretty similar. Uh, so this Agile Life uh, started because uh, a guy named John Sexborough that I worked with was saying that he wanted to to start a podcast, and I said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll be on that. We'll do that." And um, we really just started out by telling the people around us, the people we work hey, we were recording this, here's where you can find it, and let's see where it goes. Uh, as the people around us were saying, yeah, I, I enjoy listening to this, this is good. We, we, I mean, only, it only takes a couple episodes, and you probably know whether you want to keep doing it or not. Um, and then as those people around us were telling us, yeah, we like this, we would say, tell your friends. And we then like, really just very organically, if you'll get a Twitter account, and send out Twitter messages every time we do a release. Um, talk on there. Like if you have something to say that is related to the podcast, say it through the podcast um, channel. Uh, and and then oftentimes like the podcast channel on more on the this agile life stuff, we would write what we had to say and then put like a dash in our own. Twitter handle so that people would know which host was saying it, but it was, they could follow one channel and get this Agile Life content from Twitter too. Uh, I didn't realize how much that was kind of a secret to marketing. And, and, and then Elixir Outlaws was a lot of the same stuff, telling people, hey, we're doing this, telling people at conferences, hey, have you heard this? And, and it just spread. And, and took off and, and did well. And I think another thing is I don't I don't really podcast for anybody else. I love all the listeners. I don't podcast for you. 
a podcast for me. I get to sit and talk with people that I enjoy being around, people that challenge me to be better in my career, and sometimes in my personal life, in in my technical programming life, uh, whatever it is, I get to sit with these people and learn from them and have fantastic conversations with them. And if anybody else gets anything out of it, then that is awesome. And and so that's why, like, when we do our podcast, there's there's nothing that's scripted. We just talk uh, about whatever's on our mind, which also runs into, you know, you're listening to an Elixir podcast and you get to hear about building your garden <laughs> instead of Elixir. But I'm sorry for that. If you if you tune in for Elixir or if you if you tune in to uh, Brad's podcast here to talk about business and then we start talking about haircuts and COVID-19, I apologize. <laughs> Yeah, no, no worries. I, I think there's like a nice side to that too. It feels relatable. Like I, I'm not super interested in building gardens, but if I heard that on Elixir Outlaws, it reminds me that like, hey, these guys do things other than just sling Elixir 24 um, seven. And then, you know, that's, I guess, inspiring is probably not the right word, but it instills some hope, I think. Yeah. That like, hey, maybe I can be as good as them too. And I don't have to dedicate the rest of my life to like reading the OTP manual. I don't know if they're if we're any better. We're just loud about what we do. <laughs> that's, that's really it. Uh, that's I tell people that all the time. <laughs> we, we just we're just loud. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. I I almost guarantee that you're a better Elixir dev than I am, just because I have very little experience with it. But being loud is probably also key. <laughs> um. So. Shifting yet again, sorry, just jumping all around. Um, I, I was curious more about some of the community development that you've done over the years. So you ran several meetups as well, right? Yeah, I, uh, I took over the St. Louis Ruby meetup many years ago uh, when I was driving back and forth. Um, so people who tell me that it's that it's too hard to drive to a meetup, I drove 100 miles to a meetup, and I was usually the last person to leave. I had to drive a hundred miles back, so um, I, I don't blame you. If you if you don't like going to meetups, that's that's fine. But just don't don't use driving or any other excuses. Just say I don't want to go. That's great. Um, anyway, sorry, sidetracked. Uh, so <laughs> I, I I started out um, working in that meetup. The uh, the guy that was running it, Jeff Barczewski, moved and was doing a lot more JavaScript work, and. He was running the meetup, but he wasn't even really showing up, and and so I just said, "Hey, I can I can run and take this over for you if you want." And so I took it over. Uh, it, it led for a little while to me doing a lot of monthly talks because I, I didn't know how to find people to give talks, and um, just I, I just started inviting everybody I knew again, a lot like the podcast. Just invite everybody that you know. Um, try to get sponsors and um, to provide food and stuff like that food food is key at meetups it seems like uh, and and just start to build a community and make friends and when people aren't coming and you're friends with them reach back out and ask them hey like where, where, you, where you been lately and sometimes that's all it, all it takes is people just want to know that uh, their presence there matters to you uh, and and through being involved in things like that, I, I got to meet other people who were just coming into development and encourage them. And, and um, in some ways, I hope help grow them. I know uh, Crystal Martin is one of the um, one of the organizers of the Strange Loop Conference. And Crystal showed up at a Ruby meetup one night, just out of the blue. And she was a math teacher at her city school. And she'd never written any Ruby or anything before. And we were pairing off and doing TDD uh, in different ways and then comparing test suites. We were all writing the same software. We wrote a stack, an implementation of the stack, assuming that there was no array in Elixir or in, in uh, Ruby. And I sat and, and I was like, well, you, you can be my pair. And, and that night she was writing tests and, and, working code right then that night and she's still a developer today and and those kind of things and, and people that were there telling me that i had an impact on their life is is um, humbling and gratifying 
at, at the same time. Like it's like, I, I can't, no, it's not me. It's you. You're amazing. Uh, but at the same time, it feels really good when you hear that over and over. So then it's easy to keep going. So uh, when I started getting into Elixir, I went to a, um, well, I guess I've been into Elixir for a little while, but I went to a polyglot programming meetup and ran into another guy there. And I, I was talking about Elixir at the meetup and, and he's like, we should have an Elixir meetup. And I was like, right, we should start one. And like, I think it was the next month we had the St. Louis Elixir group. And then um, when I moved to Kansas City, I, I started getting involved with the Kansas City Elixir group. Um, I'd like to say I'm a co-organizer. I don't really know that I am. I think I'm a co-organizer in the end, but <laughs> I spend way less time than a lot of the other people are putting in. Uh, but being involved in that community, I think, I think it helps business-wise. I think it helps uh, my own technological growth, and I'm very extroverted if it's not obvious. So it helps me in that manner too, uh, to get out and meet new people. And grow. I, I love people. I love meeting people um, and being around them. So I just keep pushing the community in that way. And, and through all these connections and meetups, it's actually caused me to start wanting to sponsor um, conferences. And I've sponsored a few conferences. We're, we're a tiny company and we're sponsoring up there with, with big giant companies. And it, because we want to give back, um, we want to give scholarships to people that are thinking about getting into programming or um, maybe just don't have the money to go to conferences but but probably should be there because they're trying to grow their career um so i i really enjoy getting involved in in those small community conferences local conferences that that are reaching out and trying to bring new people into the community that's awesome. Yeah, that's um, more than I realized that you did community-wise. I, I knew about the meetups uh, from previous conversation, but I didn't realize that um, I, you had such a big presence at conferences as well. I, I would assume most of those are probably local or Elixir conferences. Is that correct? Um, right now, they are Elixir conferences that I've sponsored. I, um, let's see, we sponsored Elixir Days. We sponsored Gig City Elixir twice, Lone Star Elixir once. Uh, and then at that ElixirCon, um, with the other members of the Elixir Outlaws, we kind of threw a side conference at the conference um, for in the evenings and, and uh, hung out on the Lazy River and brought t-shirts and food. And, and um, we donated all that. Like, nobody paid to come to that because we're trying to bring people into a community and so yeah come on down and get a shirt hang out that's another thing that you can do if you want to spread the word about your podcast is put shirts on everybody <laughs> it works it works pretty well we have uh, to get a, a slick logo like the elixir model with the the cowboy hat oh yeah and the scarf fots fots lacroix <laughs> it's a poorly pronounced lacroix uh and fots stands for friend of the show oh nice <laughs> Yeah, um, logo-wise, not there yet. So that's something I'll have to figure out. Um, interesting. So so you've done a lot over the years, um, and everyone seems to run into issues from time to time. So I, I guess I'm curious if there were, with any of the projects or any of the adventures that you've gone down, um, have you ever thought to yourself, man, maybe I shouldn't be doing this? Uh, yeah, yeah, there, there have been a few times, at least individual projects, I thought, there's, uh, this is dumb, I should not be doing this project. Uh, my only fixed bid project ever uh, was uh, um, a disaster, and I'm, I'm, I don't blame the client. Um, I think that we both didn't realize what we were getting into, the client and us, and it was only two weeks. I thought, ah, oh, yeah, how bad can it be, two weeks? And I worked 80 hours both weeks. I had a subcontractor who was also putting in all those hours. Uh, I was paying him hourly, but I was doing the weekly rate for, for me and for him. Um, and at the end of it, we didn't get what we wanted for them. Um, we spent a lot of time fixing stuff that was broken when we got there and that we didn't realize. And I think we just didn't do enough upfront research to know that. And 
and I don't think that the client knew that either, knew that there were those problems there because of past developers that they had, had working on it, past contractors. Um, and so we had to fix a lot of stuff to get to the work that needed to be done. And, and we got a good percentage of the work done. And at the end of it, I told, I told the owners of the company, I said, I, I, can't, I can't keep up this pace and I can't keep doing this. And that was a really hard thing to do. I had to pull the trigger on them. I had to eat a lot of humble pie and say, I, I, you know, I've been trying really hard and I had been communicating with them along the way that this is tough. I think we can still make it though is how I kept feeling, um, which I, I think everybody out there knows that feeling. It's done some technology stuff. Yeah, just five more minutes, I'll be done with this ticket. Uh, I always said I didn't want to spend my entire career five minutes, I'm done. Um, but that that job really felt like it. And, and I think that it also reminded me why I didn't want to do fixed failures because I think that it puts us in adversarial relationships as far as um, a client and, and developer. Because if we're doing fixed bid, I want to get it done as quickly as possible and minimize any loss that I could have. And I don't want you to be able to change anything because that extends that time. And, and then you want to get as much as you can and push hard for whatever price you have coming in instead of being in a uh, mutual working relationship, I feel like it starts out on the wrong foot. So that that was bad. I, you know, if that had been longer than two weeks, I probably, finally now, I would have been sunk and I would have quit. I would have been done. Um, and then some days trying to grow the company. Growing is hard whenever you're a cash company. You know, I, I store money up and then every year I pay so much of it to the government that I'm like, man, I could have hired somebody on that alone. Um, and and that is hard to watch and, and hard to grow. And some days it's like, man, I I see other people that I know that started companies that, that got a bunch of loans and their companies seem to be successful. And when I talk to them about their books, maybe not. Maybe they're, they're living in a lot of debt but they are growing. I'm like, that's kind of the company size I want is, is to be growing like you, but it, it's, it's hard some days when you're, when you're like, I, I just need to sit back and, and slow down. And then it's like, well, if it's not growing faster than this, should I quit? Should I just go work for somebody else? I might make more money if I did. <laughs> Uh, mainly because I, I keep all of the money in the business. I, I pay my, I make less now as a developer than when I first started developing. Um, but I don't know. I, my passion's in it, so I, I keep going. And and I get to pick and choose my clients. I've twice been without a client for four months because I was telling people no, like sorry, um, I don't think I would be good for you. Let me help you find somebody. Uh, or I don't think you're good for me necessarily, which is going to make me not good for you. So yeah. um, that has been the big benefit to being on my own is being able to do that and have control over what clients are coming in. And if I if I want to work with somebody, but it also makes me passionate about every project that comes in. I don't choose clients that I'm not passionate about. Yeah, you're really. I, I mean. It sounds like the dream job, right? As long as you can continue continue to make ends meet and you know live comfortably, because mm -hmm. you work with people that you enjoy working with. You work with both. I mean, the people you hire or the people you contract with. And it sounds like a very uh, symbiotic relationship on that front. It it sounds nice. No, no, customer management's hard. Talking to new customers is hard. And one thing that I've learned in trying in hiring other people is, all of my clients were word of mouth. I wasn't really doing marketing. I wasn't really doing advertising. I, I, I still, to this day, am, am trying to figure out how to actually go out and find new clients versus letting word of mouth come to me. I think that word of mouth is a great way to grow, um, but the learning learning about marketing, and, and that's not my forte and not what I like to do. Uh, I want to program. <laughs> I want to work in cool projects, and I want everybody who works with me to come to work every day thinking, wow, I've got a fantastic, amazing project. And, and I get to work on cool things on my, on my noggin day on Thursday. And I just love coming to work. That's the company that I want to build. 
and sometimes my focus can't necessarily be just on those fun things. Uh, I have to do accounting. I have to, uh, my Thursdays, half of my Thursdays get taken up with, with work, getting all of the other non-client work done that needs to get done to keep the business running. So my noggin days are usually limited to noggin hours um, instead of days. But in the end, if, if I make the place that I envision, and the people that work with me are as happy as I envision the company to be for them, then, then it was worth it. It was worth all that extra work that I get to really enjoy doing. Yeah, that's um, signs of a good leader, in my opinion. Well, thanks. <laughs> so, I guess. My next question, we'll, we'll wrap up here in a second, but um, how do you how do you get ideas of what to do next? I mean, it sounds like you're somewhat reactive to uh, incoming clients, but for either binary noggin projects or just projects of your own, like wh where do you get your inspiration and where do you get those ideas? Hmm, that's a tough question. Um, I was just telling somebody the other day, I'm a person who can live with an awful lot of people. Uh, which does not make a great idea for me. I don't even realize the pain's there often until somebody asks me, like, "Hey, why do you, why, why is this so painful?" And then I'm like, suddenly, it's like a flood of feelings of pain, and I've been doing this pain for years. Why didn't I fix this? So a lot of it is just listening to other people when they start asking questions, like, "Why are we doing something this way? Why? How can we do this better?" Then, then that's when my brain off uh, listening to people at meetups it doesn't have to be clients it doesn't have to be employees but a lot of it is like i'm working with a client and i see a problem that they have and something that could be used by a, a wider community and and so i try to get them i i, I talk to clients ahead of time and i say hey this one thing is not really your trade secret but it could be used by a lot of people can we make sure that we build it in a way that we can release it and should we, whether we release that under your name or our name or some joint name, it would be fantastic. And, and most clients are, are pretty into that, especially if they get to put their name on it. So I'm like, and some of them are like, yeah, just release it under your name. Um, so a lot of it is just scratching our own itches and listening to, I guess, listening to other people's itches. Uh, I, I think that's probably why I've done less commercial projects as far as the noggin day type stuff and more uh, open source projects is because I feel like I'm scratching the itch of a tech person and usually in small for me those are the things that I look at that annoy me um, and when people start talking about them those, those small things are, are like the gnat that's in your ear you just want to get rid of it um, but nobody's really going to there's nobody feels like they get a lot of um, uh, glory out of out of swatting the gnat away, but but I like to swat the gnat away. So those those are my things. Uh, other people like Connor have completely different. You know that he's working on nerves, so that that drives him. Um, fixing his car, those things drive him. Scratching his own itch, um, and I also used to keep. I should start doing this again. I kept, a, I call it a developer journal. I keep a, a little journal, like like the Molsky, you know, just lined paper, college rule notebook, whatever, next to you while you're working throughout the day. And uh, if you run into a problem, write it down. If you have a question, write it down. Um, just write little observations down throughout the day of that notebook. And then at the end of the day, you just read through it. And a lot of times ideas came out of that, um, whether they got put into client projects or open source projects or just turned into me telling somebody else, hey, this could be really cool if this was solved. I don't have time to do it. What do you think? And, and they would take off with it. Um, and, and it also helped me know where to where to look at like the next language. Actually, out of, out of a dev notebook is where I started looking more into Elixir. I've done a little bit of Erlang, done a lot of Rails. And a lot of Ruby, and you know, I've been hearing about Elixir and kind of watching it on the periphery. And 
I don't remember exactly what it was, but there was something I remember writing in a notebook and I was reading it at the end of the night and was like, you know what? I need to look into this more. And I just dove in head first at that point. Um, I remember that night getting on and going through a tutorial and then writing a little, uh, a little Elixir app with a couple gen servers that were talking to each other um, by the end of the night. And I stayed up way too late. <laughs> I remember it being like two or three in the morning whenever I stopped working. Um, but yeah, just that is one way that I, I guess I can, I can hear the annoyances is because I have those little thoughts, leading thoughts of, Hey, what about this? And so I would just write those down. Um, and then just self-reflection at the end of the day too. Uh, I do a lot of that. I have a little thing called a monk manual, um, a little, shouldn't call it little. It's a, it's a planner. It's a journal. Uh, they have, they have like some weekly, monthly, and daily pages in there, but it's very focused on what are the top three most important things uh, that you, you need to accomplish tomorrow, and then your other tasks, and then reflections on the day two, and and a theme every month that you write at the top of every week for that month. You write at the top of every day, and you, you do that every night. You write the next day, and you write the theme, and it's just a nice little reminder, like if your theme for the month is to be more generous, so you write generous as your theme. And then that also has a major impact. Just writing that over and over has a major impact on what you're thinking about and what you set down as your priorities. And then at the end of the day, when you're reflecting, you may maybe write down a few questions, draw a picture or something like that in there. And it has, has had quite the impact. Um, I was doing it on just paper. They have a, I can give you a link, I think. They have a uh, place where you can sign up to be able to download the pages. Um, and then... I was using it long enough and it was having an impact that I, I finally pulled the trigger and, and bought the book. Because um, I probably played it out enough that I might as well pay for the book. Interesting. I feel like I've seen the uh, monk manual somewhere else before. So I, I feel like I've heard of that. Um, actually, a couple times now that you've mentioned it. It is very cool. I like it a lot. I'm going to grab a charger, if you don't mind. My battery just turned on at 8%. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. I'll be right back. Oh, man. i to pull out that old Mac, and the battery just doesn't last as long. All right. Well, um, we can go ahead and wrap up, actually. So I guess okay. regarding anything that we've talked about today, uh, starting a business, running a podcast, building developer communities, um, if anyone's interested in learning more about those things, do you have any tips or resources you could share? Hmm. I wish I could. Uh, <laughs> I'm I, like, most of that was just um, working it over the years. And if you want to work on building community, there are at least a lot of places to volunteer. Um, jump in and see if you can help out at the local meetup. Uh, there are uh, groups that are dedicated to just new people coming into development. Go, go volunteer there. Uh, I, I even think that going and volunteering at a soup kitchen is a great way to start thinking more about how to build community just by seeing what's going on out there. Um, but yeah, just get, get involved with the local meetup, reach out to something um, like Elixir Bridge uh, or Rails Bridge and, and see if you can, you can volunteer to help, um, right? Volunteer to, um, to run the desk at a conference. If you can't sponsor a conference, you can, you can volunteer to, to work at the conference and then you usually get to go for free or at a, a steep discount. So that's awesome too. Um, and, and when it, reaching out to people is really, really the thing that I would say is, is what you should be doing in, in every aspect. Uh, they're, they're, people are better than, than resources, <laughs> um, than just going out. Uh, I, I don't have any huge tips on, on blog posts or anything to get involved in communities. Starting a business, um, I think takes a little bit of luck. Maybe a lot of luck, being in the right place at the right time. 
is is part of it. Um, but being ready and convincing yourself that you're ready is the biggest thing. When that opportunity shows up, because I think it shows up for everybody. It, if you think you want to start a business, start looking now at make, make an LLC. Go ahead and have one. It's usually like a one-time fee to your state. So that, that protects you a little bit legally and with taxes. And so start an LLC and then wait for that right opportunity and, and be on the lookout for it. And if you are thinking about it constantly, you'll see that opportunity pop up. Like my opportunity came, they asked if they could hire me as an employee and it turned into five developers over 18 months um, as a company instead of an employee. Because I just took that opportunity to ask, hey, you, why not? Why not just hire me as a as a company? Interesting. Yeah, I I think those are all really valuable as well, and I, I think that is maybe a bit of an easier ask when, um, sp sorry, specifically the question I asked is maybe a bit easier if. If I guess the conversation is more tech focused, like it's very easy to point someone to like, hey, here's a guide to learn Elixir. Right. Like this is this is the one you should use, but yeah, definitely with like all three of the things you mentioned: building communities, starting a podcast, and and, and business in general. Um, yeah, I can't think of any actual resources that I would share for any of those. I mean, just they, try and experiment. Give and take by Adam Grant. <clears throat> it's about givers and takers and and where they go in where, where they appear in the business world and it's actually very surprising um and, and there's a lot in that a lot of good tips in that book about being a giver and, and caring i think that's a fantastic book uh and if, if you're thinking of starting a business um i think you should start with what do i want to give not what i want to take um, and getting into that mindset and thinking that way is is really what what I think will drive you more than anything. Um, and there's another book called The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz that is is pretty fantastic. Um, read. I I got a, I get business books on Audible and listen to them when I'm driving, although I don't drive a whole lot anymore. Um, and and I usually start out chapter one at one time speed and by like chapter four i'm listening to it at double speed by the time i'm getting used to whoever's reading i can speed it up um, i would rather not speed it up but i have five children so we speed up the podcast so that i actually have time for the the uh, book yeah that's uh so i work with fully remote as well and the one thing i i miss about my commute is the podcast and audiobook time that i had dedicated throughout the day but um oh speaking of of commutes that is my other um suggestion actually get a job that's like 100 miles away because <laughs> if you drive for seven years 100 miles each direction every day you get so much thinking time and you stop listening to the radio you will put on a podcast and you'll listen to the same podcast and repeat four times and not even realize it and you get so much time to think and be in your own head that it drives you to, to do something. Try it. Just try it. Just go drive across Kansas one day. That'll give you plenty of time to think. <laughs> as far as uh, geography goes, Kansas City is the farthest west I've made it in a car. So haven't made it through Kansas yet, but oh, maybe, oh, maybe one day. Yeah, drive from Kansas City to Denver, and it is straight, and there's... Like no trees after you get a little ways into Kansas. You see a tree once in a while. It's just straight. Um, it's, it, Kansas has way more hills than, than I think most people realize, but it, it's a very repetitive drive all the way across the state. Awesome. Well, um, Amos, if people are interested in following you or your work, where's a good place that they can do that? Like Twitter, GitHub, uh, personal website, anything like that? Yeah, so the, the company website is binarynoggin.com, um, and Binary Noggin is also the, the Twitter account for the company, and then my account on Twitter is at Crom, A-D-K-R-O-N. Um, 
and and yeah, that's where where almost everything that I say is is on the the, tw the twitters, as as the kids say. Um, yeah, so that those are the best places to find me. Uh, almost everywhere if you're looking for me, if you search for ADKRON, it's probably me. Awesome. Okay. Well, that will uh, wrap it up for this episode of the Design Doc Podcast. Um, as always, I'm your host, Brad Seipert. You can find me at bradseipert.com or on Twitter at B-R-A-D-C-Y-P-E-R-T. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.